So good morning, everyone. We're uh, very happy to have our course uh, online on the introduction to uh, OpenBIS. And uh, we'll start off with a lecture from Dr. Katrina Barri Barriari. And just a few housekeeping points before we begin. Uh, please mute your uh, microphone since we're taping the course this morning. And also, uh, there'll be a question and answer session following the presentation. So you can put your questions in the chat to everyone and then we'll take them in order. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Katrina. Okay, thank you, Monique. So uh, first of all, hi everyone, and thanks for joining today's introduction to OpenBIS, so numerous. First of all, I would like actually to thank Monique for organizing the course and also Monique and Patricia Palagi to convince us to do this uh, online training session because I have to admit we were a little bit skeptical about it. We've never done this before. So I guess uh, we will see. So they gave us some uh, uh, very useful advice that convinced us to try and uh, we hope that it will be um, a successful day. So we will see at the end of the, of the day, of course. So just a couple of words about myself. Uh, I am Caterina Barillari and I work at EDH since eight years. And I first joined the group that was actually working on the development of OpenBIS. And then I joined the scientific IT services in 2013 when this group was uh, uh, created and uh, the group that was developing OpenBIS was incorporated into this section. I am currently responsible for the uh, research data management services uh, that we offer based on OpenBIS, both at ETH and in Switzerland. And in the first part of today's training, I will just give you an overview of OpenBIS and how it can be used to manage research data. And then in the second part of the training, I will be joined by my colleagues, Harry Lutke and Priyasma Bomik. And this will be, the second part will be a hands-on section uh, with the exercises in OpenBIS. And this will be followed by uh, a session on about the data analysis uh, of uh, the data stored in OpenBIS. And this will be done by Harry. So now let's start with the, open, the overview about uh, how you can manage your data using OpenBIS. So just uh, I want to start with giving you a little, a very brief introduction about who is the scientific IT services of ETH. Then we will move into the, the bulk of the, of the presentation. So the research data management with OpenBIS. I will also show you a couple of use cases. And then finally, I will present you the services that we offer based on OpenBIS. So we are a section, the scientific IT services of ETH is a section of the uh, IT services uh, of ETH since 2013. So we are fairly new. We are about 40 people, even if we are currently uh, constantly growing because there is a lot of demand for the services that, uh, that we offer. And most of us are scientists. So rather than uh, classic IT people, we are actually, uh, we have a background in different areas of, uh, of science. So I myself, I'm a chemist by background. So what do we do? We are actually four uh, groups in this section. One is the high performance computing group that maintains the clusters we have uh, at ETH. Uh, we have several of, of them. Then there is uh, a group that is called scientific, scientific software and databases. This is a group of software engineers that uh, uh, part of Part of this group is uh, focused on the OpenBIS development, but this is not the only thing we do. We also develop software uh, in collaboration with different uh, groups that come and ask us for these kind of services. Then there is the research IT platform uh, group, which is the group I actually belong to um, with Priasma. And uh, we provide services and platforms. Uh, so one of these is OpenBIS as a service, but we also have Leomed, which is a, a platform for uh, health data and, and also other platforms. And finally, there is the computational and data science support group uh, where uh, Harry actually belongs to. And this is uh, um, more focused on data analysis and we work on projects with different uh, groups for uh, uh, analyzing data. So this is just to explain you a little bit uh, who we are and what we do. So now we move on to the OpenBIS part. 
So I uh, usually start with uh, giving an overview of what is uh, uh, the research workflow in an experimental or in a computational lab, which you will know better than me for sure. So if you work in an experimental lab, usually you take, you have to prepare some samples on which you want to take some measurements. If you are in a more computational uh, environment, then you gather data from somewhere. And these, then at this point, you have uh, what we call raw data. And then this data has to be processed and analyzed. And eventually, this is of course done several times in different conditions. And eventually, if you find something interesting, uh, the, the main purpose of the academic research or one of the goals, uh, not the main purpose, but one of the goals is to publish these results and make them available to the scientific community. In this process, of course, a lot of data is, are generated uh, and uh, only part of this data will end up in the publication. And you don't know upfront which data will be uh, actually valid and useful for the publication and which not. So nowadays, there is the requirement both from funding agencies and also from journals to publish data according to the FAIR data principle. So I'm sure that most of you will have heard of these uh, principles. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So the published data, in my opinion, is just really the tip of the iceberg because at the bottom of the iceberg, the bulk of the iceberg is the data that you generate and we do not see, it's not published. So my argument is that you can publish data in a fair way only if you treat your data fairly from the very beginning, so from the moment you generate it. And this is a, um, a situation that we often encounter at ETH, I want to, to show you. And actually now that we work with groups also outside ETH, I can say that this is not really peculiar just with ETH, but we see this uh, pretty much everywhere. So here uh, I show the, uh, the different, um, basically the different data types and information that you generate during the research process. So you may have protocols, materials, you have your code for data analysis, then you have the data itself, which can be the raw data, some models, the process data, your results, and uh, your, uh, your notes, so what, uh, the description of what you're doing. And in the middle here, I have the storages that we offer. These are the ones we have uh, on offer at ETH. So you have the local hard disk, which can be your laptop, for example, uh, or uh, um, uh, the machine that you are using for, um, for measuring your data. Then there is the NAS, which is the network attached storage. This is another type of storage we have on offer at ETH. Then there are the tapes for the long-term stor storage, the cluster, and the cloud. And this is what we often see. So your data is uh, uh, very, very often a little bit everywhere, spread everywhere in different places. And uh, still very often notes are taken on paper notebooks and disconnected from the data. So this is uh, a very common situation, as I said, and uh, it is not really ideal. It's very hard very often to keep track of what has been done and especially by yourself, but especially by other people. So uh, this is our, actually where we aim to go. This is our ideal scenario to have all the information stored in a central place where things are more easily accessible and it is easier to reconstruct uh, the history of what has been done. And this is easily doable uh, with uh, using a solution such as a combined ELN and LIMS, where ELN stands for Electronic Laboratory Notebook and LIMS stands for Laboratory Information Management System. And this is actually what OpenBC is, it's, a, it's such a solution. So now a couple of facts about OpenBeast. First of all, OpenBeast is an open source software and it is distributed under the Apache uh, 2 license. It has been developed at ETH since 2007. So it's, uh, it's a software that has been around for over 10 years now. Uh, it is actually a platform for really managing the information that is produced during the research process from the very beginning until uh, the publication, basically. So you can store all the information that you generate during the research process into OpenBeast. 
It can be used in most quantitative uh, science fields. So our, uh, we started with life sciences, but in the last couple of years, we uh, have expanded to other use cases that are uh, um, still in quantitative fields like physics, environmental sciences, material sciences, and so on. And it is used, uh, of course, at ETH. Uh, we offer it as a service, but also in other universities in Switzerland and also in some European and other universities, because as I said, it's an open source software. It is freely uh, downloadable, so it doesn't have uh, um, any, any fees associated, any license fees associated with it. And uh, just in a nutshell, uh, OpenBIS is a solution for, uh, for a research lab, for collaborative work. So it's not a software that you just download on your laptop uh, and use it uh, like this, but it's a client server application. So you have a database that is installed on a server and uh, uh, then the users access OpenBIS via a web interface. It can be used to store information about uh, materials and samples, uh, uh, whatever you use in, uh, in your lab. So here we see uh, the default life science version. So we have some things that are default, but these can be customized uh, to your needs. So if you do not use any of these things, you can create the, the folders you need. So here you see we have an inventory with materials and different collections. If you want to add additional collections that don't exist here, this is absolutely possible. So here I have an example of a chemical collection. This is a table where I see all my chemicals. I can filter this table, I can export this table, I can import tables and so on. Then uh, it can also be used to store protocols. So protocols are standard procedures uh, of uh, things that you do in, uh, in the lab. And this is, again, we have in the inventory a method section where protocols can be stored. Again, this is the default for life sciences, but it can be customized to your needs. And uh, this is what a protocol might look like. So you have some, uh, the name, the description, the procedure of the protocol. And here, what is interesting is these uh, parents section, which are basically the connections to things that you have stored in the inventory. So here I have a connection to a chemical and some buffers, for example. These are the things that I use in my protocol. Then it can be used also as an electronic laboratory notebook to describe your experiments uh, when, when you do them. And in this case, there is a section which is the lab notebook part. And uh, in the lab notebook, each person has a folder, a personal folder, where they can create projects, experiments, and what we call experimental steps. And then here you see a description, for example, of uh, an experimental step uh, and uh, where I have the goals, the results. And then again here, this, uh, uh, this is what is very interesting. This is, these are the parents, which are essentially the links, again, to the materials and methods that I have stored in my inventory. And then this connection can be visualized as a tree like this. So it is easy basically to reconstruct the history of what has been done. You can click on an experiment and see uh, what has been generated from this experiment, vice versa. You can click on a sample and you can see where the sample has been used or on a protocol and so on. Then we have, of course, the data management part, uh, which is where OpenBIS is particularly strong at because this is actually how it was born as a data management platform before being an ELN or a, or a LIMS. So data can be uploaded to OpenBIS in two ways, essentially. The first way is via the web interface. So once you register an experiment in your, uh, in your ELN, you have an upload button and you can just upload your data from, uh, from there essentially. And this is fine if the data is not too large. So we are talking about a few gigabytes. Then the second mechanism is via what we call Dropbox mechanism, which has nothing to do with the Dropbox, with the commercial Dropbox uh, program. But basically how it works is that this can be done either manually from the users or automatically directly from measuring instruments, the data, are moved to uh, what we call a Dropbox folder. And from here, data are then moved uh, to OpenBIS. And then the data are connected to an experiment. So here I have my experiment, in this case, the flow cytometry experiment. 
and the data that were generated in this experiment are here, are linked to my experiment. So here I clearly have this connection between the two things, which is missing if you use a paper notebook. Then we also have a tool that is called Big Data Link. This is uh, uh, to be used when you have uh, data, large amounts of data. So here we're talking about uh, maybe hundreds of terabytes, which you already have sitting somewhere, like for example, on a cluster. So it's difficult to move them to uh, a different storage like the OpenB storage. In this case, you can use this tool, which is uh, a command line tool based on Git and Git Annex. And basically what you would do here is to use OpenBIS as a metadata repository. So you describe your experiments in OpenBIS and then you just link your data to OpenBIS. So this is how it would look like. You have uh, this kind of sign, which is a link. So here is my, my data. And then when I open this uh, folder in OpenBIS, what I see is the information about where my data is. So if you, are, uh, if you have access to the data, you cannot access the data directly via OpenBIS, but you have to go to the server where your data is sitting or to the cluster where your data is sitting. Then uh, we have connections to uh, Jupyter and MATLAB for data analysis. And these will be shown at the end of the second part of the training by, uh, by my colleague, Henry. And uh, basically uh, in OpenBIS, we have integrated the Jupyter notebooks. So you can launch Jupyter notebooks uh, from uh, either uh, from different places in, uh, in the OpenBIS interface. And then you can store, you can uh, write your notebook, do your analysis and store the results back. So the notebook back to OpenBIS. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Jupyter notebooks, this is how a notebook would look like. It's a little bit a combination of text. So you can write, uh, you can describe what you're doing and then you have your code and the results readily available. So it's all in one and it's much easier than to follow what what you're doing, you can describe your analysis, you can share your notebooks with, uh, with your colleagues, you can also publish these, uh, these notebooks. So they are becoming a very powerful tool for, uh, for data analysis. They support also uh, over 40 um, programming languages, among which R and Python, which are usually the most, uh, the most used uh, programming languages. Um, and uh, uh, they are really very, very powerful. So finally, OpenBIS also offers several APIs, uh, which stands for Application Programming Interface. This means that you can work with OpenBIS programmatically. So you can, we have some advanced users that do not do anything via the user interface. They do everything via the command line. So you can create uh, things, you can extract data from OpenBIS, you can register data into OpenBIS via everything via command line without in, uh, interacting with the user interface. And this is just one, uh, one example. So um, the APIs here were used to generate uh, a workflow uh, that was used for genomics data analysis using this workflow manager called SnakeMake. And essentially here, I'm not gonna go into the details of the workflow, that's not the point here. What I just want to show is that basically this was used, this workflow was used to analyze data that was stored in OpenBIS. This data was taken out of OpenBIS, sent to the cluster for analysis uh, uh, using this workflow. And then once the analysis was finished, the results were stored back to, uh, to OpenBIS. And this is possible thanks to the OpenBIS APIs. So here are some, some additional features about uh, OpenBIS. Uh, I already mentioned the relationships that you can establish between different entities and that allow you to keep track of uh, the history of what, uh, of what you're doing. And this is a very important functionality. I believe our users uh, uh, like this OpenBIS especially for, uh, for this functionality. Then you have uh, uh, import and export functionality. I already mentioned before, you can import and export uh, files, uh, tables, uh, and, and so on. Then we also have user rights management. Uh, so you can control who has access to what uh, and uh, which kind of access people can have. You can have read-only access or admin access, user access. Uh, so you can control the access to the system. There is an audit trail, which means that uh, everything that is done in the system is logged in the database. So we can see who has changed uh, what and when. It's, uh, it's possible to, to trace this back. 
Um, by data immutability, I mean that when you upload data files to OpenBIS, these data files become read-only. So you cannot modify them on the fly. You have to, if you want to modify something that you have uploaded to OpenBIS, you have to download it, modify it, and upload it again. Um, there is also uh, the possibility to use the sample storage manager. So this gives you an overview of uh, the, the storages. So the freezers and fridges that you have in your lab, these are the physical storages where you store your samples and you can have an overview of them. So you see where your, your samples are. Then we have a fairly new functionality, which is the barcode reader. This was just very recently introduced in OpenBIS, so you can track your samples also uh, using barcodes. And then also another new functionality is this integration with data repositories. So we have integrated Zenodo, which is a generic uh, repository for uh, publishing data when you, uh, for sharing data when you um, publish. Uh, something and the ETH research collection. This is specific only for uh, uh, for ETH. So now I want to show you a couple of uh, a couple of examples uh, of how OpenBIS is used. And uh, uh, we have uh, the first use case is the cellular dynamics lab at ETH. So this is the um, device lab. And uh, these are some of the techniques uh, they use. So this is light microscopy, RNA biology, protein biochemistry, electron microscopy. This is what they do. And uh, how is OpenBIS used in device lab? So here they are one of the first, the early adopters of uh, the ELN functionality of OpenBIS. So it was introduced in this lab in 2016. It has been made mandatory uh, for all lab members since 2017. So all the people who work in this lab have to use OpenBIS and upload their data to OpenBIS. So they have uh, um, an inventory for samples actually they already had a previously uh, um, previously some databases that we imported in openbis and they use it for their samples and for their protocols they use a lot this parent child relationship that i mentioned before so these connections so either when they uh, basically when uh, they uh, create uh, reagents when they use reagents to create a new sample uh, or to link experiments and protocols uh, to link uh, experiments uh, uh, together also. Then uh, we have a second use case which is something completely different. This is the Bedretto project uh, at ETH. So this is uh, uh, more uh, geology um, geological use case let's say so here in this project they are studying how to if it is possible to reuse the geothermal heat as uh, an alternative uh, energy source so they have basically drilled some boreholes in this bedretto tunnel which is a tunnel connecting ticino and the furca tunnel and uh, sensors have been placed in these boreholes uh, and they are analyzing data that is generated by, that is uh, con um, retrieved by these sensors. So these data are stored into OpenBIS and analyzed using Python via the PyBIS, via PyBIS, which is the Python API in, in OpenBIS. And here is an example of how they have organized their OpenBIS. And it is actually based on, uh, they, they only use the lab notebook, not the inventory in this case. And uh, basically they have organized it by, uh, um, by project rather than by people. Uh, so by default, usually each person in the lab notebook has a folder. In this case, they decided uh, that they wanted to have it uh, project based. So this is possible. This show you that you can customize the system to, to your needs how you want. And uh, the last use case comes from EMPA. So uh, this is, we are currently running a pilot project uh, with, uh, with EMPA. There are a few labs that are currently using OpenBIS at EMPA. And uh, uh, this is one of the labs, which is the concrete and construction chemistry lab, where they study actually concrete. So they do some, they uh, measure different properties from concrete samples, like the shrinkage uh, of, the, of the concrete. And here you see an example of what, uh, what is the shrinkage. And basically, we started, this is the map, what they do uh, and what they want to track in OpenBIS. So they have a specimen on which they do different measurements uh, and they uh, use different samples uh, and uh, 
this was uh, put into OpenBIS, so they used both the lab notebook and the inventory. So this was uh, totally customized to their needs. So we don't have defaults for this. We worked together to customize the system for how they needed to use it. So you can see that uh, it's, uh, it's really fl a flexible solution that can cover really a wide range of, uh, of use cases. And now we come to the services that we provide based on OpenBIS. So uh, we have at ETH, we offer three different types of services. The first one is what we call Research Data Hub. This is a, what we call a multi-group OpenBIS instance. So it's one OpenBIS that can be accessed by several groups at the same time, but of course each group only sees what belongs to them. They do not see the things from the others. It is centrally managed by us, so it's a shared resource. Uh, we only allow here limited customization and uh, the service is for free, is offered for free to all ETH research groups that want to use it and only the storage costs have to be covered by the groups. Then uh, we have the departmental data hub, which is very similar to the research data hub, with the difference that this is dedicated to groups uh, that belong to a particular department. So at the moment we have one uh, of these instances for one department that decided to have their own for the groups that belong to that department. Uh, the difference here is that there are also service fees associated with it and it can be customized for the needs of the groups of the department. And then we have the research data nodes, uh, which are basically dedicated open bases. So it's one open base per group, essentially. So this is a um, more customizable solution. It's uh, dedicated to the group. It's managed by the group themselves. And in this case, also there are service fees that have to be covered by the group plus the infrastructure costs. And in addition to this, of course, we provide training and consulting. To all, the, to all the groups that use OpenBIS. And then uh, we have also uh, a national uh, service uh, we have that is called openrdm.swiss. This is in Switzerland. At the moment, this is a project funded by Swiss universities and our project partners are the University of Zurich and ZAV. Uh, but the project started in 2018 and will finish at the end of this year. And then from next year, we move to service mode. Uh, so what we do here is that we offer OpenBIS as a cloud solution. We use which engines for this, so we can set up uh, virtual servers either per group or per institute or institution. Optionally, we can also provide Jupyter Hub servers for uh, data analysis with Jupyter. We can also uh, offer support for self-hosted OpenBIS. So if uh, someone would like to uh, use OpenBIS, but on their local premises rather than on the cloud, we can provide support for, uh, for these, for both to the users and also to uh, the IT uh, experts to set up uh, OpenBIS to install it and maintain it in the future. We also provide training and best effort user support. It is also possible to uh, establish a contract with us, of course, if you want more than the, than the, basic, uh, than the basic service. And the current users we have uh, are from the University of Bern, EMPA, I mentioned already, ZAV, and the University of Zurich. And this is here, you have the email address uh, if you want uh, to contact us uh, for, uh, for services uh, in the context of openrdm.swiss. I will share the slides at the end of the at the end of the talk. So, and this is us. So, this is a, a picture that was taken fairly recently. I think it was just after Christmas. And these are the people who are primarily involved with uh, with OpenBIS. And here I have some uh, uh, contacts and uh, uh, useful information. So some links, uh, we have uh, the, some uh, video tutorials and uh, some documentation available on our website. Uh, you can also uh, see uh, the other things we do uh, at SIS on, our, on the SIS website. We also have a Twitter account, so you can follow us on there. And these are the, uh, the two contacts that you may want to use if you want to have more information about this. So I think uh, now I am done with the overview for uh, about OpenBIS uh, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any.